Hello, everybody. I'm Pamela Marshall at the Wellness Radio TV and at the Wellness Radio TV podcast. Welcome to the Timbuktu Report. I am so glad that you are joining us. And I want to invite you to share this with your family of Facebook people. You know, it's one of those days you have locks, Dr. Stevenson, and you think that you can't have a bad hair day. But no, how do I have a bad hair day? My, my ball won't sit straight. <laughs> <laughs> um, my guest today, as every week on the Timbuktu Report, is Dr. Rick Stevenson, who is a professor of African American history and African American studies at the University of Memphis. Welcome, Dr. Stevenson. Hey, how are you today? Besides your hair giving you the blues, is that? I don't know what's up with that. It's wow. raining. I've only I only have one or two different ways I get my hair done, and that's down and down. <laughs> down and down, yeah, yeah. Oh, so I hope I hope my whatever. I'm not gonna worry about it. That's not what you're watching for anyway. You're not watching to see my hair. You're watching because you want to be informed, and I'm very thankful that we have the opportunity to inform those who are watching, those who are listening because this is critical. So this is, I, it's hard to believe that this is our 12th show. Yes, number 12. I mean, can you imagine? And 12 is a good number. They, they were 12 disciples. So there's something with that number. Yeah. It's 12 wow. months in the year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good thing. And my, and my daddy had 12 children plus one. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so Dr. Stevenson, you yeah. know, you came here to um, teach at the university and um, we met as a result of um, my friend Robin. Yep. You were playing tennis with her husband. And then through dialogue and before you know it, we are doing this show called the Timbuktu Report. And I felt that it has served such an incredible uh, purpose in opening the eyes of so many people, probably much like some of the students that you teach at the university. Absolutely. I think you, you left out one, I think, important part when we met. And that, that was, uh, I met you on one day and then you and your husband threw a birthday party for me the next day. Oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. You, you and Victoria came to dinner. Exactly. That's right. Seems like I've known you longer than that. No, November 29th. It was Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, and we had so much food that everybody <laughs> came back over because your birthday was the next day. Right. And and we had an impromptu birthday party. Yeah, it was amazing. It was so much fun. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. I am forever in your debt. <laughs> it, it, was, it was easy. It was easy. Yeah. Thank you for what you're doing and what a wonderful blessing it is to have you be able to share your years of knowledge with those who have been watching over the last few weeks and over the last 12 weeks. And if you have not seen any of the other shows, you can see all of them on our Facebook page or you can go to um, my website at www.atthewellnessnetwork.org. So what drew you to doing this? A couple things. I know that a significant portion of our educational system is designed to neglect and to delete the contributions of people of African descent, uh, people of brown descent, and women. And so as a historian, as I'm reading uh, primary source documents for classes or for sources, for documents that I'm writing, uh, I'm constantly reminded how important it is for the person who doesn't have co college access, who may not read, uh, who may travel in circles where these kinds of conversations don't take place, that this is a, an opportunity to spread the truth. My uh, One of the courses I'm teaching now uh, introduction to African American studies. I had my students uh, looking at a couple of videos by scholars who talk about blacks in America before Columbus. 
And the truth of the matter is that there is botanical evidence. There is metallurgical evidence. And there is written evidence that Columbus did not discover America, that Africans were here in the early 1400s before he even arrived. And yet that's not what our kids are start taught in school. And so when my students begin to see this information, they are aghast because they feel like they've been deprived. Mm -hmm. right? They've gone from elementary school to summer down juniors and seniors in, in, in college, and they're just now getting this information. So, so my drive was to is to get this information out on a platform where we can reach hundreds of thousands of people at one time. And again, remember, a lot of the, only 23% of the American population have bachelor's degrees. Less than 1% of the American population have PhDs. So there's a lot of people who never get to college. So that ought not be the only place where you can have access to information that will better inform you. That's the first reason. The second reason is I believe that one of the biggest problems that we have in our country in regards to race relations is under education. If we knew each other's histories and how much we have contributed to each other, uh, we might uh, be able to deal with this issue of race and diversity a little bit different. Uh, and if you listen to the conversations of a person who is racist, most often they are historically inaccurate. So those are some of the things that drove me and still drives me to present this information because I believe that if we're better educated, we can make better decisions. Or they suffer from <clears throat> illusionary superiority. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Liatosis, I call it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so as, as you know, it, it, the more I'm learning from you, it feels sometimes overwhelming mm -hmm. because we have grown grown up with these truths. Sure. Via our school system that black people fought so hard to be a part of the public education system because as Representative Barbara Cooper, who is a retired teacher but state representative in Memphis, mm -hmm. said we trusted that they were gonna do the right thing with our children. Exactly. Well, in reality, they were not doing the right thing with the white children because they were not giving them the truth either. Exactly. I mean, there, there are simple, simple um, antidotes. For instance, Thomas Jefferson wrote a document in the, early, in the 1800s that argued that if you could not read by the age of 15, you could not be a citizen in the colonies. And then right after that, they passed laws that prohibited teaching black people to read. Mm. So now you see this, this, this systematic approach to undereducation and mind control, right? So uh, I, I think that um, what we're doing and what we're being led to do, what God is calling us to do um, is to use this new, this new normal this this platform called the internet uh, and all these other sources like Zoom and uh, StreamYard to get that information out to people because the only way we're going to become be able to come together as a collective and that is across racial lines, uh, gender lines, etc., is to be better informed. And who better to do it than you and I? Well, you know what, it, and, and there, there are people, uh, there, there's some white ladies that I'm able to get together with once a week, uh, but they're black people who, you know, propaganda impacts everybody the same way. Sure it is. Now, the white ladies that I talk to may not have had to deal with some of the things or did not have to deal with some of the things, but they don't, they have not been taught either. And sure. they're white people who want to know. They sure. want to know. Um, I, I'm aware of what we have here in this country, but what is it that I can do as a white person who has lived in this system of privilege to help right some of these wrongs? I think you, I think you just answered your own question. And that is they have privilege. They, 
they are able to be in the boardrooms, they're in the meetings, they're in the the they're in the HOE meetings where arguments about changing the name of a location like hell that we're not. Um, one of our friends is a part, lives in hell, and they're talking about changing the name. And this individual wrote me an email saying, this is what I'm going to say in a meeting. And I was so impressed because the person was arguing and they're white was arguing that hell needs to be changed because of its historical history of a plantation. I'm not in that meeting. So, you know, what your white friends can, can do uh, is use that privilege to help build some of those bridges. But understand though, that there's backlash that comes when you start using your privilege to help other people. And when you give the statistics about the low percentage of Americans that have a higher level of education, um, and then there are those who are enlightened by their limited uh, where source mm -hmm. that is only going to give a view that um, feeds into a narrative that continues to perpetuate what we are witnessing in this country. That's true. I, I, the reason I give the, those statistics though is not as much about the statistic, but those who control the narrative. In other words, a significant portion of the books that students read, especially in college, are written by PhDs. But if 80% if of those PhDs are white males, mm -hmm. over 50, who are not into integration, who are not into diversity, who are not in gender, into uh, sexual orientation, you know, then it, those, those books are tilted. You follow me? And that's what I was trying to say, that one of the problems is there aren't enough people of color, there aren't enough women, there aren't enough people in different uh, uh, sexual orientations who are writing the books that can make this narrative have more fruit to it. That's my point. Right. And but still, even as we talk about the general population, if you don't have if you just in public education, if you've been told stories that are not true stories. Yeah. And then you go to college. But even when you go to college, not everybody has to take a class in African-American studies nope. to get a college degree. They should. But they don't. But they should. I'm going so, to write in. I'm going to write that into the next voting registration make it make it a referendum absolutely it, even just true 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 history sure uh regardless to to what it was just tell you know, what's wrong with telling the truth and and i think that i think that it's the fundamental truths that i think get me as a my my uh my training my re, my expertise is between 1600s and 1870. I like to focus on the Middle Passage, plantation, early revolution. And one of the things that that gets me is, for instance, I would be, we would be hard pressed to find someone who knows who Crispus Attucks was, mm -hmm. right? Christmas mm -hmm. Addicts was the first person killed in the Revolutionary War, Boston. Mm -hmm. Through the bar with some friends, riot breaks out, he gets killed. And, and uh, Emerson refers to it as a shot that was heard around the world. The beginning of the Revolutionary War, first man that dies is a black man. Okay? Mm -hmm. The Declaration of Independence that was written by Thomas Jefferson actually went through 86 revisions before they accepted it. And one of the reasons it went through so many revisions is because 41 of the 52 signers of the Declaration held slaves at the signing of the Declaration. So when they talk about all men being created equal, they were not talking about black people, right? Now, why was that? 
why why these why these revisions because there are 168 words that were left out of the original declaration of independence that actually spoke against slavery huh. it actually spoke against slavery and the debate went back and forth until they came came down with a with a declaration that excluded those words because they wanted to maintain slavery as an economic balance for this for this nation. And those are the kinds of things that if we knew, and these are four or five hundred years ago, four or five hundred years ago now. But if we knew that information as a collective, we might be able to come together as a cross national, cross ethnic cross-cultural community. But because it was hidden and, and because the goal of hiding it was white supremacy, we are where we are today. So Dr. Rick Stevenson, you know what we, oh my goodness, we started talking and we didn't pray. Oh, I did to myself, but go ahead. <laughs> and I started to mention to you, but we're online. You should have. <laughs> well, you don't, you you don't <laughs> No, no. I just jumped right in and look, it is, Never too late. Okay. You still got blood running warm in your vein. Yeah. Got breath in your body. That's let's, right. Let's tell the Lord thank you. Okay, let's pray. Lord, forgive us for not starting out the way we're supposed to. But we pray that all that we said would still be anointed by you and that ears will hear it and eyes will see it and lives will be changed. We bless you for this platform. And we pray that as we continue that uh, we say those things that bring you glory and honor, but also that will uplift the people who hear it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's like so, when, when we eat sometimes and we start eating before we pray, so we have to pray for the heathen who ate the food before they prayed. So they got it. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for this food that I'm swallowing. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. So, so Dr. Stevenson, um, do you think sometimes that even as African Americans, that we we drop the ball ourselves because you know while it was again it was illegal for the slave to learn how to read we've been reading for a while now yeah. Yeah. so so and part of our culture in Africa was storytelling narrative sure yeah. and we we stopped telling our story to our children and yeah. and they don't know you yeah. know I was I was in the company of some eighth grade African-American boys who didn't know black people used to be slaves in this country. Just recently? Well, they're now graduated college. Wow. One of them has graduated college, yeah. Interesting, interesting. I am. Um... So what, what's the responsibility of families? Because just as so many other things, we have to start taking responsibility for teaching our own. Sure. Um, there's a couple ways I would approach that. Uh, we have to recognize, we black people have to understand that we will always be our first line of defense and offense. We have to be our first responders. I, my mother uh, started buying me, I don't know if you remember, they used to have these encyclopedias. There was a, a, a man that would come door to door. They, the first that I got was burgundy. Mm -hmm. And the, and they and my mother would buy one book at a time because that's all she could afford. Mm -hmm. So she bought the entire set. But she made it. She 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 knew that if I were going to be successful, and my siblings, my two brothers and two sisters, one thing she had to do was invest as best she could. Now she only had a high school education, but that didn't stop her from making sure that we went further. All of my all of my brothers and sisters, except one, are degree. All of us. Uh, and there's two doctors in my family, an osteopathic medicine brother, and so we we learned early on that if we were going to be educated, the school system was not designed to do that. It could add to what my parents taught us, but our parents were the ones who invested in us. I think that we have to we have to take that mantle back, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we have to take back the responsibility of pouring into the lives of our kids, pouring in. My son, my youngest son, especially Corey, when he was younger, I wouldn't let, whenever we went out, he had to take a book with him. It didn't matter where we were going. If we were going to a tennis court, he took a book. 
you know, because when he wasn't playing, he was reading. If he was in my truck riding with me, he had to take a book. So it's those kind of things that we need to get back to, um, Pamela, that will, I think, uh, change that narrative in our own community. We can't re we can't rely. Oh, I'll say it this way. Malcolm X says you cannot expect the oppressor to teach your children. And enough people obviously didn't hear Malcolm X say that because exactly. that, that's what has happened. But that's even right. even for uh, families of other nationalities in the United States of America, whether you are Korean or sure. uh, mm. from from Mexico or you're white. I think that the only way that anything can move forward is with truth. And then especially in the church. Yeah. And so I, let, me, let me just, let me just, so we're, we're taking a look at the shows that we've done and let me say hello to some people who are watching okay. Jackie Thrasher in Louisville, Kentucky and my cousin Darius Marshall and Rita Harris. Thank you all so much for watching. Please, please share this with your sphere of influence. I think this is critical information that we need to hear over and over and over again. But we started this show, the Timbuktu Report, in the midst of um, the police killings. And one of the things that we talked about was the history of law enforcement in the United States of America, right. that most people didn't know that police departments were initially slave catching organizations. They were, it was not law enforcement that was designed to protect black people. Exactly. Uh, the first police departments, and I use that word loosely now, but the first policing agencies were actually slave catchers. As a matter of fact, I think I um, showed you some, some uh, badges mm -hmm. from the 1800s and they were shaped like stars and they said slave patrol. Right. Well, both were the first police departments. And, and it's, it's important to understand that policing then and policing now is still not really about protecting and, uh, protecting and serving. Policing is about law enforcement. And most often, the laws that are being enforced are against people of color and, <laughs> you know, and minorities. Right. Um, there's a there's a if you read if you get an email from me, the tagline says those who won't teach you right won't treat you right mm. and so you can't expect for people who are unwilling to educate you to treat you as a human being and how do you control those human beings you have to have some kind of enforcement which we call policing and so law enforcement has always been about about controlling population even gun control gun control is not about guns gun control is about controlling populations because white people have guns and they're not going to give their guns up. Even those who say we need, we need gun control, I will be willing to bet that there's somebody in their family at one time or another who had guns and still has guns. Because guns were never about, gun control has never been about just about guns. It's about making sure. Here, uh, uh, David Chappelle says it this way. If you want to fix the gun control problem, every African-American person in the country who can do it legally ought to get registered to get a firearm. They changed the laws then. <laughs> when all of us had guns, they changed the laws. I promise you. <laughs> and so it's, it's, it's those kinds of um, things that we're duped into believing. It's like this integration. We will never be able to integrate into society that's designed to oppress you. We, you may assimilate, but if you assimilate, you've got to give up part of yourself to be a part of society, right? This country was never designed to bring in people who were other than white and male. They eventually started bringing white male women. But if you look at every, every migrant group, the Irish, the Italian, <clears throat> uh, the Scottish, the British, they all had to go through a phase where they were not white. The black mm -hmm. Irish the black Italians, you follow me? And then they eventually became white. We are the only people on the continent that will never make it to that stage of white. Mm. Even some Native Americans. Even the Native Americans that have integrated into white society and they're still getting their, they're not giving up the Native American check they get. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But <laughs> but they uh, you you don't even know that they're Native American. They don't even talk about being Native American That's because right. they have been able to integrate in a white culture. And here we are. Yeah, we, we call that passing, right? And there have been a number of successful black people who have passed, and in this and in a sense, their passing helped to change some rules, some laws, and regulations, at least bring things to the forefront. But sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. So you let let's um so we, we talked about the history of the police departments that most people were not aware of that these were slave catching organizations. And there've even been reports about uh, who is actually being hired in some of these police departments that oh, yeah. they still have connections to groups that are hate groups. Sure, 2005 and 2006, Homeland Security and the FBI produced reports that said that they uh, noticed that a number of your white supremacist organizations and KKK type organizations were having their members join the police departments. They called them ghost skins. Uh, they were skinheads, but they were ghosts. And, and so now what you have is you have KKK members, you have uh, skinhead members with badges and guns and uniforms. And then you add to that um, qualified immunity. Man, what you've got is murder for hire. Because because qualified immunity it 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 removes the judicial effects that could or, would occur when a police officer kills someone who is unarmed. And and the problem with that is when they pass those laws in Congress, they never told us about it. I'd be willing to bet you that unless a person has been involved in law enforcement or has been involved in community organizing, they know nothing about qualified immunity. And the reason that every time a, 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 a police officer shoots someone who is unarmed and they, get, and they get a leave of absence is because of this act called qualified immunity, where they are immune while they're doing their job if they kill someone, unless they, unless they can prove there is a, a continual act of violating a person's, a person's rights or people's rights they get immune from it. So then you become, if you are a KKK member and you're a police officer, you can pretty much do whatever you want to do. And then even if there is an offense that you are fired from that police department, there have been incidents where they just move you to another police department. Or another state. In another state, yeah, yeah. There's, um, there's a book. There's a book called... Um, at the hands of persons unknown. It's a, it's a study on lynching. And the, the title comes from what the medical examiners would write on the death certificate of a black person who was lynched or cremated or, or, or set on fire or murdered. And the reason that uh, they would sign the death certificate, uh, the cause of death, uh, at the hands of persons unknown is because they knew who they were. They knew they were the sheriff. They knew they were the judge. They knew they were the store owner. They were they were probably a part of it, you know. But in order to keep from tattletaling or snitching, as we would call today, they would sign the cause of death at the hands of persons unknown. Well, that's what's pretty much happening in this country right now, except that we're seeing it. We're, we're, we're watching it on video and people are still getting away with it. Dr. Rick Stevenson, we have talked about a lot of things. And as you're talking about uh, these kinds of acts that happen, and I, I think about my mother and how uncomfortable she would be so many times, uh, scared for her own sons and her family and daddy probably as well. He just did not show it in the way that she did. Uh, my father born in 1915 and my mother born in 1927, uh, when it was not uncommon to hear of lynchings sure. that took place. And black people just had to be quiet about it. There was nobody to report it to. Black women who were raped, uh, sure. that, and there was nobody that they could report it to. Um, how has that impacted the psyche of the African-American uh, all the way to where we are now, 2020, and things are still happening? 
in 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 the in the armed forces people who go to war and come back they suffer oftentimes from what is known as post traumatic uh stress stress syndrome mm -hmm. Uh, and they have access to psychological evaluations and conversations that help them work their way through post-traumatic stress syndrome. There is a, a, a professor by the name of Dr. Joy DeGroy who wrote a book called Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome. And she argues in the book that slavery has such an impact on us psychologically that it's a wonder that we're still alive. And yet, there are very few of us who've ever had an opportunity to sit down and talk to someone about post-traumatic slave syndrome, what it's like to be under the kind of stress that we experience. I mean, think about it. When we were kids, you, you got that talk before mommy took you to the, to the, to the, to the mall, to the store. We didn't have malls, but we're shopping. She would say, when you get in this store, don't you say nothing. Don't you touch nothing. Don't look at nothing too hard. Don't put your hands on anything. And and it was like taking a young child who has all this energy and bottling it up. And as we grew over, that bottle didn't change, but the stress did. You know, then when you become an older black man, you couldn't look at white women. You couldn't walk on the same side of the street. You couldn't do this. And then we and so on. And so what happens is from the age of six or seven years old to we're adults, we are constantly being stressed with the do nots, but we never get a chance to talk about it. And that's one of the reasons why we have some of the mental stress issues and the hypertension, et cetera, is because, because no one has taken into effect or to account that black people have made stress normal. Mm. The way we live our lives is so stressful from such an early age that it's normal to be stressed. And so we don't even see it as being stressed. That's why when people say, how are we doing? We say, I'm doing okay. When in fact, you're blowing up on the inside, right? But, but there is no other profession. A police officer shoots someone, kills them. They immediately have access to an evaluation. Sometimes they may even be taken off the job for a few days to come off it. If you go to war and yet for black people for 450 years, we have been stressed with all of the ills and the horrendous nature of slavery, and we never get a chance to talk about it. And then in the workforce, if you exhibit any kind of discomfort with what's going on around you, guess what gets said about you? You're the angry black person. You got a chip on your shoulder. <laughs> exactly. I did say to somebody once, you know, really, I, I have a log. <laughs> right. And this is why I have a log. <laughs> Exactly. But you know, but you, you get the point, right? Yeah, and, yeah, so, yeah. and so, and so, even, even as you know, as we've talked about uh, Tyler Perry's movie, Angry Black Women, like yeah. that is, we normalize that. Yeah. But yeah. we are the daughters of women whose babies were snatched from them. Yeah. We had to watch our sisters whose babies may have been cut out of their bellies. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a book called um, At the Dark End of the Street. It's, it's the story of a woman by the name of Ressie Taylor. Ressie Taylor was brutally raped by these five boys in Alabama. And Rosa Parks, who is oftentimes noted for not wanting to give up her seat on a bus, her job with the NAACP was to travel to different parts of the South and to interview women who had experienced these egregious rapes. And that's how the NAACP brought these cases. But Ressie Taylor, um, she is one of the few women that we have her. She didn't keep quiet. Yeah. You know, she told. She a documentary on her. Yeah, she told, right? And then there's a book written, uh, written about her. I have a copy. I can't think of the woman's name now. Um, but the point is, that seldom happened, right. right? You would be surprised how many young women have grown up in America having been abused and never told anyone because somebody told them, keep your mouth shut or I'm going to do this to the rest of your family, etc. And so, again, we have these kinds of stresses 
that people tend not to talk about. And we pass it on. So I think that, and I can't, I don't remember the article I was reading, but I think there are some of these kinds of stresses that we pass on to our offspring. Oh, absolutely. I, I think we talked about the research that was done at Emory University with the mice and yes. the smell of cher cherry blossom. Yes. How, how the, the, the fear continued with the offsprings of these mice, even though they were no longer being shocked, electrically shocked when they smell cherry blossoms, but generations on down the line would still tense up when they saw cherry blossoms. I do that when I see the police lights. Yeah, you and me both. I'll pull my car over. Oh, absolutely. I, I yeah. do it to this day. And I don't know that anybody directly told me to do it. Yeah. But you either have witnessed your daddy do it or somebody yeah. doing it and you want to be in the right. Absolutely. <clears throat> absolutely. The, the, the title of that book, At the Dark End of the Street, is by Daniel McGuire, Danielle McGuire. Black Women, Rape and Resistance, A New History of the Civil Rights Movement from Rosa Parks to the Rise of Black Power. And, and, and I mean, it, it's, that's, the, that's the kind of stuff that we need to read as well. I think that um, education uh, has been uh, too romanticized. I'm doing a TED Talk uh, in a couple of weeks. And the title of the talk is... Uh, de-romanticizing the middle passage right mm -hmm. the middle passage was not a slave was not a cruise ship yeah yeah you know millions of people died were beat to death they were decapitated they had their legs cut off their bodies were thrown in the water for sharks and 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 i think that american history has been so romanticized that we don't really understand the depths of the truth and that's why when we actually hear the truth it doesn't make sense because yeah. we've heard that false narrative for so long that when we actually hear the truth, it sounds like it's a fairy tale. And then even some of those around us who may look like us, as you said, have bought into the propaganda. Sure. They even look at you like, what are you talking about? Exactly. And those are the very ones that uh, Carter G. Woodson wrote about in his Miseducation of the Negro. That is, and if you have not read that book, and I've read it like three or four times. I'm going to read it again this semester because I'm using it. It is amazing because his primary argument is the very black people who should be teaching us better are not because they were taught to think like the oppressor. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you right. have these black teachers who are teaching this from an inferiority paradigm, right? And that's why um, people like Malefi Asante and... Uh, Maulana Karenga was so important when they started coming up, uh, coming up with Afrocentricity and Africana studies and so on, because it, it changed the narrative, right? It took black people from the periphery of the conversation and brought them into the center of the conversation so that we could really understand who they were. And then they did an inter interdisciplinarity. So you can't just talk about black people and not talk about science. And you can't talk about black people and not talk about medicine or mathematics because we've been involved in all that. So we've got to broaden the manner in which we talk about who we are. Well, and thus the name of the show, The Timbuktu Report. So many people have only heard Timbuktu in the phrase from here to Timbuktu. Exactly. Not even knowing that Timbuktu is a real place. Exactly. And by the way, uh, women in Africa were in were played significant roles in society. Exactly. Timbuk actually was a woman by the river that people left things with when they traveled, yeah. and that's how the city got its name. That's right. But 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 as we talk, named after a woman, named after a woman <laughs> at the well. <laughs> um, but but as we talk about. Um, math and science and all of the things and, and Timbuktu, the home of the first civilization mm -hmm. and the first library Same and court. all, go ahead. The universe Sam core. Yeah, and, and the mathematical equations that were found in those documents there. Yeah. Um, I see my cousin, uh, Johnny, who has joined, who is part of the Nation of Islam and Elijah Muhammad. When we talk about the narrative that we have bought into, even in our faith community. I did see um, Elijah Muhammad, not Elijah, 
um, Farrakhan mm -hmm. giving a speech in a prison and I could barely listen to what he had to say mm -hmm. for my heart breaking to see that sea of black men yeah. locked up. Yeah. And yeah. so we talked about that prison system, yeah. that prison uh, pipeline that is so real. Yeah, um, and that, that, you know, it's interesting that uh, there's another book, it's called The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. Mm -hmm. And she she talks about the prison industrial complex. But before that, there was the convict lease system that started right after the reconstruction, during reconstruction, 1870s. And it was white America's way of trying to re-enslave African Americans. And they did that by passing all kinds of silly laws like the vagrancy law. If you if you were stopped by a sheriff and you couldn't prove that you had a job, you could be incarcerated. And even though the fine may have only been two or three dollars, if you couldn't afford it, then you were in jail. And these large corporations would then bail you out and buy you or lease you like a car. Uh, and they would lease you to these organizations and you could be gone for five or 10 years and no one would know where you are. And so the convict lease system uh, was foundational to what now what we call the prison industrial complex. Uh, Jawanza Kanjufu started doing studies back in, a, in the, in the 19, uh, 1980s and early 1990s about young black boys and how at the age of, uh, at the third and fourth grade, um, uh, white America was thinking about how, how and where they would build prisons based on how many young black boys would make it through the fifth grade. And so this system is not new, right? They've been trying to incarcerate us forever. Why is that? Because uh, according to the 13th Amendment, if you've, been a, if you've been convicted of a crime, you can go to jail and be used like a slave. And that's why even in California, if you look at the fires they have right now, the majority of those people fighting fires are prisoners. Hmm. They're not firefighters. There are prisoners in prison who are trained to fight fires and they get like $2.50 a day when they're fighting a fire. Now, if they die, they're just dead. And the problem with that is they're, they're good enough to fight fires while they're in prison. But if they get out, they can't find jobs because they don't have the EMT training. So, again, what you have then is just another form of slavery where you're using black bodies to, to make money, to protect property. And yet they don't have the same freedoms as white people who may be criminal. So, so, so who's supposed to be telling our children this? We are. We are. We are. We, we, we have to. How can we if we don't know? You see this right here? Yeah. This is a telephone. This is not a parent. <laughs> it is a device that is used to communicate. But it is not a, it is not an instrument that is has the responsibility of raising a child. And too many of us give our kids this and then walk out the room mm -hmm. and leave them to their own devices. And then we wonder why, one, they don't have any manners. Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Thank you, please. Kids, are, I heard a kid the other day say what to an adult. I almost lost my mind. Yeah. Because when I was coming up, if I didn't yes, sir, or yes, ma'am, my parents, I said, what, uh-huh, listen, my mother would knock me the next week. And then there's some parents who don't want their children to say it, and I don't understand that because, you know, just appropriate behavior is appropriate behavior. That's what it is. Oh, you don't have to, they don't have to say that. No, they don't have to, but it's going to impact them. It sure um, How can they know lest they have a teacher? How can they have a teacher lest they be sent? <laughs> That's the scripture right there. <laughs> I know it. My cousin right. Johnny said that to me. Yeah. So, you know, um, um, so who should teach them? One, we have to recognize that that devices like computers, like uh, telephones, like iPads are just that. They are devices that enhance us. They are not supposed to be the thing that controls us. 
And until we want to spend more time with our kids, I mean, you know, we got to walk with them. The Bible is very clear that we ought to walk with our kids and sit with our kids and lay down with our kids and eat with our kids. I mean, when's the last time you sat down, our family sat down around the kitchen table and had dinner together? Right. You know, one of the things that my wife and I do is we call the no phone zone. When it's time to dinner for dinner, we leave our phones. You know, mm-hmm. once I finish working up here in my study, even if I'm, you know, or not working for the rest of it, I leave my phone upstairs because when I'm with my wife, I want to be in her presence. Mm-hmm. Right? But we're too, we, we've gotten to the point where we're always multitasking, right? We're watching TV and we're playing on a computer, and we're pl- playing on a phone and something at the same time. And so our minds are always divided. And the point, and, and you cannot, you cannot grow a person unless you are willing to make that investment. And investment means the willingness to shut everything out so that you can pour into their life and they can pour into yours. And we don't do that anymore. Our, when we grew up, you and I didn't have cell phones. Right. right? Well, we and barely our, had a telephone. And our, mem- and our memories were better. When yeah. I was growing up, when I used to, is, is this being taped? Well, I used to remember at least 45, 50 phone numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's out the window. That's out the window. <laughs> right? The yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Listen, I can't listen. I know two numbers, mine and my wife's. <laughs> well, and the last Easter program that I went to, I was appalled that children got up and read speeches. Uh-huh. Because we, we had to memorize memorized speeches. Right. So we so we 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 have dropped the ball. Yeah. Because we were so busy um integrating that we completely dropped the ball and we're suffering as a result of it. The Alachua County Port Laureate, E. Stanley Richardson joins us. He says, it's not mass incarceration, it's slavery per the 13th Amendment. <laughs> Please just... call it what it is. It's <laughs> not, it is not like slavery, it is slavery. <laughs> yeah, um, people are not willing to say that. Yeah. They're not willing to say that because there are a lot of people who are getting paid Absolutely. because this system exists where these inmates are whoever owns the prisons are being char- are being paid 30 to 60 thousand dollars a year yeah. per inmate and yeah. that was the thing that I was looking at when I was watching those yeah. men listening to uh, Minister Farrakhan and I thought wow that's a lot of money. If these guys got out of jail, they wouldn't pay them half that amount to no. go to work. Right. Nor would they be willing to spend half that amount to educate them so that they would not get there. Absolutely. So, so, so to, to religion, yeah. before, before we run out of time, we've, we've also talked about the historical inaccuracies right. in religion that has also helped to perpetuate racism in the United States of America. Exactly. And again, it, it goes back to, I think, people going to church simply to be fed, but not to learn how to feed themselves. Right. But also, I think that for a significant portion of our community, our leadership has dropped the ball, especially when it comes to exegetical methods. You know, some, some there are some denominations where you don't have to be trained to be the pastor. As long as you can make people holler and sing pretty good, pretty well, that's not a bad thing. You can get away with it. The problem with that is God does not call us to be credulous. He wants us to use our minds, right? Study to show yourself proof unto God for workmen need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He's not just talking about preachers. He's talking about everyone because the word of God ought to guide our footsteps. And if we are not studying it, how can we know when we're hearing from God? How can you differentiate from the voices if you're not accustomed to listen? When, when I was coming up, my dad. Well, let me ask you this. Let me say one thing first. My dad would come to the corner and whistle. And we do his whistle. And it didn't matter what we were doing. I could be running to catch a football. If my dad whistled, that ball got dropped. Because I knew his voice mm-hmm. and I knew what the consequences were for not listening to his voice. The point is, as Christians, we don't know God's voice because we don't read his word. So would, do you think, you know, recently there was a uh, evangelical group that raised $100,000 for the defense of the 
um, person that was involved in the shooting in Kenosha. Um, in Kenosha. They have raised $100,000 for his defense. And um, that's been appalling to some people, except when you understand that in our faith-based community, when we are starting from a perspective of the message has been flawed, so the people who who hang that over their head as their umbrella um, represent flaw, that they would do these kinds of things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that so there are members of that same group, this evangelical white movement that believes that Trump has been sent from God. Um, has for decades used the Bible as an instrument of oppression as opposed to an instrument of liberation. And here's the problem. You can use any passage of scripture, any book, any way you want to people who don't read it for themselves. Mm -hmm. Right? God is not the God of confusion. He is a God of peace. And if, in fact, the people of God are those who really follow him, the Bible says this, the devil is a liar and the truth is not in him. The Bible says that the devil is the father of lies. And so if you have someone who is constantly lying, how can you say that God sent him? When the Bible says that God is the truth, the way and the life, and no one comes to him except through the father. I mean, through the son. How is it possible? How can you say that God is truth and then say this man who lies all the time is sent from God? That's contradict. That's antithetical. It doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And so those those people who have bought into that, in reality, they have bought into the the lies, the geographical lies of Christianity. Exactly. Not only geographical, that, like when you talk about, I, we, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about Simon the Cyrene, an African who carried the cross with Jesus. I've been in the ministry over 30 some odd years. I've only heard maybe two or three people preach it from that perspective. They never mentioned the fact this man was African. They never mentioned the fact that, that God selected an African man to participate in our salvation. Why is that? Well, you can't tell someone that they're inferior because of their skin color and then say they help participate in your salvation. It doesn't make sense. It's antithetical. And again, if we're not reading with the, with the lens, the, here's, here's the problem. And I hate to keep jumping around like this, but these things keep coming to my head. I, tr I try to tell my students, when I give you a reading assignment, and one of the reasons I always send them questions to answer from their reading it's because I don't want them to do the reading just to get it done. I want them, I want them to critique it. I want them to examine it. I want them to understand different terms of geographical location, et cetera, because I want them to, to really read that text so that if there's any error or non-corroboration, they know how to find it. Because for the most part, when we read something, we're just trying to get it done. Mm -hmm. We have a reading assignment. I got to read 10 pages. I'll read the 10 pages. But if I ask you what you read, you don't know mm -hmm. because that's not the goal. And the goal is to read the 10 pages. Say it again. You just read the 10 pages. You can say, yes, that's that I read the 10 pages. You just did the task. And mm -hmm. that's what happens oftentimes with the Bible. We may even have a devotion, but we'll read, the, we'll read it and get it done and say, I did my devotion today. But did you learn anything? Did it affect the way you walk? Did it affect the way you treat people around you? Probably not because you didn't examine the text. And so we miss those things like he was from Cyrene, which is e which is Libya, which is North uh, Eastern Africa. You follow me? We miss that kind of stuff because we're not critiquing what we're reading. We're just trying to get it done. So we, we're from a culture, a society that said you cannot read. It was illegal for you to learn how to read. Sure. And there must be a reason for that. Sure. Then when the law says that you can be taught to read, 
then there is a stigma associated with being smart. So our children now don't want to read because they're being told that that's not cool to know how to read oh. and to be smart. Yeah. Yet it used to be illegal. So you you have these um, things that keep shifting. And yeah. so I uh, there was a, an interview on the BBC with the arch, uh, one of the bishops of Canterbury. Canterbury, mm-hmm who said, we have got to start telling the truth about Jesus being black. That is so uncomfortable for people, Dr. Rick Stevenson, that the man, not just the man that carried his cross, but the man that they nailed to the cross was also a man, he was black. Yeah. I'm not gonna say a man of color, because everybody is of color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, here's the deal, I, and I use this jokingly. Uh, the Bible says that God told Joseph to take his son, Jesus, into Egypt to hide him. Now, if we know well, that, well, well, if we know Egypt that he's in Africa, him. right? Mm-hmm. It's kind of hard to hide a white baby in a black community, right? <laughs> you really got to understand that in order to blend into the community you have to at least look similar to some of the people that you're blending in with. But but that's not the point. The point is that God is not a racist. The Bible does not talk about race. It does talk about culture. It does talk about religious perspective. It talks about mono and polytheism, but it never talks about race. Why? Because it didn't exist. Mm-hmm. You see? And so now that we have applied this 19th, 18th century approach to the scriptures, that's where we have the conflict with people who saying, well, he couldn't have been black because, well, that kind of thing didn't exist then. That wasn't part of the conversation. You know, there's a guy in the, in the book of Jeremiah, his name is Ebit Melech. Uh, Jeremiah is thrown into this cistern for preaching the word of God. Ebit Melech comes and pulls him out. He's an Ethiopian. He's a black man. He saves this man's life. But no one ever talks about his ethnicity. They never mention the fact that he's an African. Why? Because we've been conditioned not to look at those kinds of aspects of the narrative. Because it goes against anything that, that puts black people in a place of inferiority. But well, also, something, about, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Something else that the bishop said was that as... America is now recognizing that these uh, statues or all of the relics that represent the Confederacy right. must come down. Right. This is what he said. Right. The, the, the white Jesuses must come down too. Absolutely. I mean, well, when I was a pastor, I never... Hung- Did you hear that? Did you hear that? That these white, these representatives of a lie... <laughs> the arch now now what's the significance of what do they have in Canterbury, Dr. Stevenson? Oh um, well Canterbury is 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 one of the places where you have a lot of primary source documents for uh the church fathers, um, some of the historical Tertullian documents I think are still held there. So you have a number of documents there that uh were written in the first and second century. Many of many of them that were written people written by people like Augustine, who was an African. Uh, Tertullian, who was an African. So you have a lot of your church fathers who are referred to as Latins, but they were African. They were they're Af- actually men of African descent, and so they have these primary source documents that actually stipulate where these people uh, came from. You know, it's interesting. Um, one of my my students are reading an article now where. Uh, a primary source document tells Columbus, and then Columbus mentions it in his log, that they knew that Africans were in America before Columbus got here. He mm-hmm. knew that. He mentions it in his in his articles, right? Mm-hmm. We have access to this information. Canterbury is a place where we can have access to these primary source documents, and yet they've been neglected because there's a narrative of white supremacy that's constantly being perpetrated. And because people like you and I tend not to be in Canterbury or the Q, the Q Library in London. We don't know about this kind of stuff. 
but the, all those who do know, but also as we're learning, because E. Stanley Richardson and every person of color and every white conscious uh, white person or Caucasian person who is listening, who really wants to do the right thing, the only way that we can do what's right is to tell the truth. So February, 2021, we need to celebrate the most significant black man in the history of the world, Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> That's who Frederick Douglass has had his time. George Washington Carver and the Peanut have had their time. Black History Month 2020, have all of your little black children that need to do a report to do a report on Jesus. Now, you know, it's interesting. I used to pastor a church in uh, LA and in February, I would only do sermons on black people in the Bible mm -hmm. the whole month. Well, that was everybody. Yeah, you know, <laughs> right. But the point is they didn't know that. Okay, well, let me ask you this too. So right. even in the books of the Bible, if these people are from places where of color, how could they be named Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Okay, well, not all of them were, like Matthew is a Jew. Okay. But, but, but was he- Skin color. But was he, but okay. where was he lo physically located? He was and in- And the language, and the language of the day. He's in Jerusalem. Okay. In so Jerusalem. In the, I just wonder about, I don't, I'm learning too. I'm just wondering about the language of the day and yeah. even, you know, you know, the names. I just, yeah. I just thought I would ask. Yeah. Well, you know. Maybe, maybe another show. It's 802. Yeah. Maybe another show. But I, I think that we have to understand that geography also plays a, a sense, you know, I have a friend uh, whose name is Obawana because that's the way they name people in the Congo, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. so, so geography also plays into, uh, you know, uh, a, a nomenclature, right? right? But that has nothing to do with skin color. And, and I, I think that we have to be careful that even though we can use the term black, that would not be a term that would have been biblically accurate. They, you, you, may, you would have heard a term like Ethiopia, that meant black, as opposed to the term black, because you know, that wasn't race wasn't an issue. Exactly, you get my point. But geographically, mm -hmm. since we're identifying people by skin tone, they would fall in that category. Yes, if you just would. saw them and they didn't open their mouth. Yes, they would. They would. Then, you, then you would put them in that category. Right, and and if you if you ever listen to Jane Elliott, I think she gives a real good narrative on this. She talks about how when you move further and further away from the equator and closer and closer to the Caucasus Mountain, your skin your skin color changes along with diet. So diet also participates in how our skin color uh, is affected by the melanin that we have in it. You follow me? Mm -hmm. Like people who lived in the Caucasoid Mountains, which further away from the sun, are much lighter than the people who live near the equator. Right. You follow me? And so we also have to take that into account. Even though you may have started in Egypt, if if 10 or 15 generations down the line, you're moving away from that, that melanated community, there's going to be a skin color change. Now, that's why you have to understand that race is a social construct, has nothing to do with genetics. Because well, you, know you can what? be very, very, very light and still be, quote, black. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Well, doctor, look, this has been uh, some very, <laughs> very fascinating, enlightening uh, conversations. I thank everybody for watching and your comments. As we continue this Timbuktu report, what, what is your goals? What, what, what do you want to happen with this? Um, I, you know what I'd like to really see, especially once we get out of COVID, is to have, when I was in junior high school, Going into high school, there was a, a woman around the corner from me who actually introduced me to African American studies, mm -hmm. um, or Afro American studies. Then. And she's had these meetings in her basement. Mm -hmm. And uh, this guy named Mr. Hemi would come in and he would talk to us about Africa. That's how I began to really get involved and understand that my history was 
was being stolen from me. And I would like to see something like that, where we have a, a community hall where we came together and we we read various, we read about African scholars like um, uh, uh, Muhammad Abu uh, of, of, of Sankor, you know, uh, how we begin to incorporate the other aspects of our heritage. I think that is it's a shame that that Muslims uh, and Christians don't get along. I think it's a shame that that black people who can still be shot by police officers are fighting amongst each other because we have different religious backgrounds. I think that's just crazy because we have too many things in common that we need to stay together. And the reason we don't do it is because we're not having this. We don't have a place where we're coming around the table and looking at our differences, but also recognizing our commonalities. So I would love to see a place where we could meet on a consistent basis and, and do a study on Timbuktu and do a study on Lagos and do a study on the Congo and, and so on. Well, I, I think that in this age of COVID, probably had it not been for COVID, we probably wouldn't even be doing this. So the good that's coming out of this yeah. and uh, my friend Jones Stevenson says, thank you so much for providing and presenting this valuable information. I'm learning so much from the Timbuktu presentations and discussions. Joan, thank you. Thank and you. and uh, Dr. Stevenson, uh, we will continue. Yeah. Next week, we're gonna talk about, we're gonna continue the conversation about- Nubians. We're gonna talk mm -hmm. about Abbot Melik next week. Nubians in the Bible. Nubians in the Bible. Now, so, Nubian means black. Okay. <laughs> You know, um, I, I, I just think that if I'm going to be called black and if Jesus looked like me, then can we call him with the same thing you call me? Absolutely. I That's would. all I'm saying. Okay. If he looked like me and you call me black, then call him what you call me. Amen. So, which is so exciting. It's so exciting. I think our children can be liberated. I think that people would feel a greater sense of uh, a desire to come and learn. I agree. I think it's, I, I think it can just be, um, you know, because think about, we talk about why are black people shooting black people. If black people looked at each other as in, in, a, in a valuable kind of way. Sure. I think we could see some end of violence and hatred among ourselves because that, that's where it has to start too. I agree. We have to start valuing ourselves, not to discount any of the other stuff that's happening. I that agree. that must be addressed, but I, we also have to value ourselves. Absolutely. I'm trying to find something real quick. That, oh, we're, ooh, we're out of time, aren't we? We are. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Well, maybe I'll show you. Dr. Wesley Hammett did an extensive research on melanin versus region theory. Um, I would love to connect with Dr. Wesley. Yeah. Connect us. Is he is he here? No, I don't, I don't know. Uh, my cousin in Atlanta who's watching in Atlanta. Look, I love all of you all. I thank you all so much for watching. I thank you for sharing. Dr. Stevenson, thank yeah. you for sharing your wisdom and knowledge. And I know that you are where you are today for such a time as this. Oh, thank you. And likewise, I appreciate the fact that we can, um, we can collaborate and we can be servants, not only in the hand of God, but servants to our community to help change this narrative, but also hopefully build bridges. Right, with truth. Build bridges, yeah, build bridges with truth. There is nothing that will set you more freer, and that is really not the way you're supposed to say it in English, but <laughs> there's nothing that will set you free like the truth. <laughs> and it never changes. <laughs> it never changes. The truth will always be the truth. <laughs> It will. The truth will always be the truth. There's Again, no thing as alternative truth. <laughs> give, give. Uh, yeah, we we're we're a little over, but that's okay. Because <laughs> guess what? <laughs> Nobody can turn it off but me. <laughs> See? And we got our own staff, right? <laughs> yeah. 
and they they do whatever I tell them to do. <laughs> so for our entire team <laughs> here at the Timbuktu Report, for Dr. Rick Stevenson, uh, give my love to your wife, Victoria. Do it. Like Tell it. her have fun packing. <laughs> but for COVID, I would come and help her. <laughs> um, for our entire team at the Timbuktu Report, we thank you all so much for watching, for liking and sharing and being a part of this very, very liberating conversation. Our goal at the Timbuktu Report is to inform, enlighten, and encourage. Prayerfully, we will join you again next Thursday at 7 p.m. Central Time, not Central, Eastern Time. In the meantime, um, if you want to see all of the other episodes, you can go to our website at www.atthewellnessnetwork.org. Make it a great moment. Until next time, I'm Pamela Marshall at the Wellness Radio TV and at the Wellness Radio TV podcast. For our entire team, we bid you a good evening. I do. Peace. Peace. <laughs>